A black schoolgirl was assaulted by three white boys. Science shows red meat is bad for you, and men are paid less than women for equal work. The only problem with all of those headlines is that none of them are true. We will examine the latest hate hoax, then some science hoaxes, and then a whole slew of political hoaxes. Then Joe Biden's corruption defense continues to crumble with a new photo that just came out. And President Trump congratulates communist China on 70 years of misery. All that and more. I'm Michael Knowles, and this is The Michael Knowles Show. Oh, this story had everything the media wanted. This, you, I'm sure you saw the headlines. It was about a school where Mike Pence's wife works and a young black girl was assaulted, physically assaulted, by three white boys, proving America's racism, proving that we haven't done anything to better ourselves in this country. It had everything that the media wanted. White on black racial bigotry, a cute little girl, in a Christian school, not just any Christian school, but the one where Mike Pence's wife works. So the mainstream media ran this story everywhere. Here is just a little smattering of the breathless reporting. Local news, national news, CNN. I don't know if CNN counts as national news because three people watch it and then it's just on in the airports. But nevertheless, here is the media running with this story. Police in Virginia are investigating reports of an attack at a school. 12-year-old Amory Allen says three boys cornered her and cut off some of her locks. And here is, here is how she describes the incident. The boys came up to me and like they ambushed me, sort of, like ca caged me in. And so they put their hands over my mouth, they put my hands behind my back and they like started cutting my hair and saying that it was ugly. The Emanuel Christian School reported the allegations to law enforcement and said they have a zero tolerance policy on bullying and abuse. This is the same private school where the wife of the vice president, Karen Pence, teaches two days a week. The office of the second lady has not commented on the incident. School officials say that all the students involved, including Allen, are not attending classes during this investigation. The school says it is, quote, deeply disturbed by the allegations, adding that Emmanuel has a zero tolerance policy for bullying and abuse. Vice President Mike Pence's wife, Karen Pence, teaches art part time at Emmanuel. Uh, that's something that garnered national attention earlier this year when it was revealed that the school has a policy banning gay students and parents. OK, before we get into the actual story itself, Let's just correct the record on what they're saying about this school. They're saying it bans gay students and parents. That is not true. It enforces traditional Christian sexual ethics. So it doesn't care if you're gay or not gay, but you're not allowed to uh, commit sex acts that are outside of traditional Christian ethics. I'm sure that they're not exactly supportive of the hookup culture either, or thruples or threesomes or any of those things too. Just a minor point. On the bigger story, cute young girl says that she's been viciously attacked by these boys. There's a racial angle. It's pulling on the heartstrings. It's backing up the mainstream media's biases. So local TV, national TV, every newspaper runs this story. And if it were just those stories, if it were just what you just heard, I could almost see it. Why? The media are biased. They like to run stories that confirm their biases. They hate the Pences. They hate Christianity. They think that America is hopelessly racist. They're convinced of it. So I actually sort of get why they would run it, okay? Not, uh, this isn't uh, me completely knocking the media for this. But they didn't just leave it at that. They had to get more and more sensational. Here's another story on the same story from CNN. <laughs> 12-year-old sixth grader Amari Allen is healing after she says three white male classmates at Emanuel Christian School in Springfield, Virginia targeted and attacked her because of her hair. Okay, this is where the reporting becomes really irresponsible. Also, why is she playing violin? What on earth does that have to do with the story? Why does it begin that way? I don't, because they're obviously constructing this narrative. This good, studious girl, she's uh, even nicer than she seemed on the first news clip, and now they're, she's being victimized by, I don't know, probably mini David Dukes or something like that. And where the reporting becomes irresponsible is they don't have any evidence that the story actually occurred. And the wording is important here. So if they had said, 
If they had said, 12-year-old Amory Allen says she is healing after she alleges three boys pinned her down, that would be one thing. That would be a news story. They don't say that. They say 12-year-old Amory Allen is healing, is healing after she says, and then they go on. That's a big difference because it turns out that she isn't healing because it turns out she was never hurt in the first place because the problem with the story is that it never happened. It wasn't true. Here's how we know. We'll get, we'll get to how we know in a second. We'll get to what this means for our culture and for the news media. But first, I have to thank a new sponsor. We love these guys over at Rock Auto. So I've thought about this recently because I was having a little car trouble on a drive up to San Francisco. The car parts business doesn't make sense anymore. The way that the car parts business works, you go to the shop and they never have the part that you need. I mean, the parts are so specialized now, they don't keep them in stock. So then what do they do? They go on the internet and then they mark it up a huge percentage. And then for some reason you pay these guys to get you the auto parts you want. Skip that, get, get rid of that. Go to rockauto.com. Rock Auto is a family business. They've been serving auto parts online for 20 years. Go to rockauto.com to shop for auto and body parts from hundreds of manufacturers. They have everything. They have engine control modules, brake parts, tail lamps, motor oil, new carpet. They have parts that I don't even know what they do because I don't know a whole lot about car parts. Uh, But what I do know is I want to get the cheapest deal that I can possibly find for excellent quality parts, cut out that middleman, not have to pay all of these uh, ridiculous markups. Whether it's your classic or whether it's your daily driver, you can get everything you need in a few easy clicks delivered directly to your door. I love these guys. I think they're they're a terrific company to begin with just as, in terms of their character and they provide a service that is totally ahead of the curve. They are just great. Even the web, I love the website so much because it's so simple. Somebody like me, I'm a millennial. I don't know a whole lot about my cars. I just know I like them to drive. I like them to work. And they make it so simple for you. The rockauto.com catalog is unique, very easy to navigate. You can see all the parts quickly that are available for your vehicle. Choose the brands, specifications, and prices that you prefer. I love these guys. Great selection, reliably, incredibly low prices. All the parts your car will ever need. rockauto.com. Go to rockauto.com right now. See all the parts available for your car or truck. And then, this is the most important part. You need to write Knowles in their How Did You Hear About Us box so that they know that we sent you. Uh, We love these guys, so please uh, give us a shout out over there. You're going to love their products. That is rockauto.com. Write Knowles in the How Did You Hear About Us section. Okay. So that's the the problem. By the way, I, I showed you a smattering of the news stories about this. This was all over the place. Print, TV, radio. And the problem is the story never happened. The family now admitted that it was a lie. How did we find out it was a lie? Because law enforcement officials investigated it. Here's the girl's original story. Quote, one of the boys put his hand over my mouth so I wouldn't scream while they used scissors on my hair. They were all laughing, calling me ugly and saying I should never have been born. This is pretty awful to hear about this. That even that, forget even the racial aspect, which is what the media ran with. Just think about the sex aspect. You've got these three boys doing this to this vulnerable girl. It sounds terrible. Then she goes on, she says, they ran off laughing and I was just sitting there. I'm hurt that it happened. All I want to ask them is why. I mean, it sounds really bad. Daily Beast ran this story breathlessly without checking on one single fact. Now they're paying for that today when the truth came out. Uh, Her mother said it took two days for the little girl to admit that the attack happened. Except now we know that the attack didn't happen. So what's going on here? The 12-year-old initially said, when she was asked by her mother why she was missing parts of her hair, she said she was playing beauty salon with her friend. So she was, you know, playing a game, and the ki- I guess the kids cut each other's hair. And then two days goes by, and then she changes her story and said these kids held her down and, and tried to hurt her and threaten her. You do feel for the girl. I mean, what kind of situation made this girl make up this story and accuse her classmates and and do all those terrible things. Could be the case that, you know, the girl cut her hair off with her friend or by herself and then she didn't want to get in trouble with her mother so she made up this story about her classmates. Who knows? This is what the mother said though. My concern is how did they not see what was taking place on the playground all year? Karen Pence, the vice president's wife, works at the school. There's security and secret service anywhere, everywhere. How did they not know? 
Right. This is the point in the story where you've got to turn your faculties of reason on and say, hold on, this has got to be one of the most secure schools in America. Nobody heard about this. Nobody saw this happen. Maybe something isn't right about the story. And the girl, the, the little girl made a big issue. She said, they had scissors. They could have done anything to me. They could have done it. So she's saying they could have, I don't know, stabbed her, cut her, killed her. She went on, I was afraid if I told the teacher, they wouldn't care. What, what about this teacher makes you think she wouldn't care if, if kids were threatening you with scissors and cutting your hair? Doesn't hold up. So the police investigate. That's good. And the girl's story fell apart. Why did she lie? We don't know. Maybe she didn't want to get in trouble. Maybe she thought there would be some sort of social reward for this story. Maybe something else happened and we just don't know and she just wanted to do it. I don't really blame the girl all that much. Kids do stupid things. Kids make mistakes. That's like the definition of being a kid. I do blame the parents a little bit because they didn't look into it. But again, parents are going to defend their kids, generally speaking. So I don't even blame them as much. I blame the school a little bit more. Mostly, I blame the culture. I blame the pop culture. I blame society. You can, I know, I sound like a leftist. It's society, man. It's, but it sort of is society here because we have become so gullible, so shallow as a society that we eat this stuff up. The media run with it. I do blame the media a little bit. The media in some ways are a reflection of us. We have a culture that tells us, believe all women. You remember during the Kavanaugh hearing, that's all you heard. Believe all women. You say, well, I want to believe credible women and I want to disbelieve women who are not credible. I want to disbelieve liars. Like we were told we had to believe all women as though women are a different species. I can, I guess I can only speak from experience being a man. Men are uh, broken creatures with imperfect natures who lie and sin invariably. I guess one exception in all of history, but we'll get into that later on a religious show. Women are the same thing. Women are in our species. They're not a completely separate being. Women are capable of lying, but you're not allowed to say that now because of the feminist culture, the leftist culture, and the Me Too culture. So we have this culture telling us, believe all women. We have a culture increasingly telling us, believe all children. And there's actually a major feminist, uh, Megan Murphy, who's coming out against this culture. We'll try to get to that a little bit later. But that is what the culture is telling us. Out of the mouth of babes, we need to follow children. They know so much more than adults do. And they don't. They don't know that. But we have a culture, that we have this culture, rather, that encourages leftist lies and excuses them until, e until those lies are exposed, and even, I guess, after those lies are exposed. So the school makes this comment. They say, quote, we can now confirm that the student who accused three of her classmates of assault has acknowledged that the allegations were false. We're grateful to the police department for their diligent work. We're, while we are relieved to hear the truth and bring the events of the past two days to a close, this is the key, we also feel tremendous pain for the victims and the hurt on both sides of this conflict. Excuse me? There is no both sides to this conflict. There is a little girl who lied, who was abetted by a complicit media. And then there are the victims, who are the three little kids who were baselessly smeared as vile bigots, and maybe their parents too. It isn't, oh, we all have something to be sorry for. No, we don't. I don't even really blame the girl. I blame the media a lot more than I blame the little girl. I mean, I guess the mother should punish her girl for lying. Parents should punish their kids when they lie. But kids lie. Kids do bad things. I do blame the media. I do blame the school. I don't blame the three little kids who were baselessly accused of being bigots. I don't, I, I feel sorry for them. And I don't feel sorry for the people who perpetrated this. But the left always does this. They do this every time one of their lies is exposed. They'll run with some story. I mean, this is a great example of it. And then it'll turn out to be a hoax. And they'll say, okay, so the story wasn't true, but it gets at a greater truth. Okay, well, Duke Lacrosse, that wasn't true. The, the Duke Lacrosse team didn't rape that woman. But it gets at a greater truth about rape culture. Okay, the Jesse Smollett hoax, that wasn't true, but it gets at a greater, it doesn't get at a greater truth. Lies don't get at greater truths. Lies are lies. They're bad. They should be condemned. There are victims of lies. There are victims of this dishonest culture. And guess what? There are a lot of hoaxes. Let's just look in just the past year, just the past year, two weeks ago, Edwin Kaufman, 
I don't know if I'm even pronouncing that right. He's an ex-Tampa Bay NFL player. He trashed two of his own restaurants. He spray painted the N-word on the restaurant. He spray painted MAGA on the walls. Now, he didn't do this honestly out in the open. What he said is this was, he was the victim of a vicious racist attack. He wasn't. He did it himself. Why did he do it? I don't know. The money, the attention, the fame. Who knows? One month ago, a 19-year-old guy with gender dysphoria, Andrew Smith, he was in Illinois, he found an, a noose in an elevator by his room and he said that he was the victim of a hate crime and people were coming out of him or coming out against him because of his gender identity. He wasn't. He planted it there himself. This came out when the person that he tied the noose with admitted that it was all a big hoax. That was one month ago, back in June. A bakery in Ohio won an $11 million ruling against Oberlin College. Why? Because Oberlin College, the, the administrators, the faculty, and certainly students there, accused that bakery of racial profiling against black students. Why did they do that? Because three black students had been arrested there for attempted robbery. This was a big deal. They basically shut down the bakery. Then it turns out the students admit that they were actually going to rob the store. And so it was a total hoax. Back in March, the Southern Poverty Law Center, that absolute hate organization, came out and said that white racist Trump supporters in Mississippi burned down a black church. And they spray painted all sorts of terrible things on there and they spray painted, vote Trump. Guess what happened? Turns out, later revealed, the guy who set the fire to the church was not a white supremacist. He was a black man. And he wasn't coming in from somewhere far away. He was a member of the church. Why did they do it? Couldn't tell you. And then, of course, back in February, you have Jesse Smollett. As Dave Chappelle calls him, that French actor, Jussie Smollett. Jussie Smollett, who pretended that he was attacked by two white supremacist Trump supporters in the middle of the night on the south side of Chicago. Or somewhere, I don't remember exactly where in Chicago. While he was holding a Subway salad. Who gets a salad at Subway? I don't know. Somehow during the whole attack with bleach and a noose and MAGA hats, he didn't even drop the salad. Nobody, nobody seriously believed the Jussie Smollett thing when it happened. Well, let me rephrase that. No serious person believed the Jussie Smollett thing. A lot of people seriously believed it. In the media, in the left wing, especially white liberals. White liberals love this kind of stuff. But serious people didn't believe it for a second. Those are just like the first five on the list. This goes on and on and on. You can look, there, there are various websites that have indexes of all these hate hoaxes with links to the media reports at the time and then links to the updates. This is something of an epidemic. The left wants to pretend that this never happens. Why? Why is the right so much better at identifying these hate hoaxes? It's not because racial attacks don't happen. Racial attacks do happen or sexual attacks or attacks motivated by some other kind of bigotry. They do happen. They just don't happen that much. And when they do happen, you really want to look at the details to make sure it's, it's true because who are, who are the victims of the Jussie Smollett hoax? Well, Trump supporters are, conservatives are, half of the country are because he tried to smear us all as racist and being a part of a racist bigoted movement, which is not true. The other victims are the actual victims of hate crimes and bigotry. Because every time there's one of these hoaxes, people take them less seriously. So who are the victims here? Well, certainly those three kids, the three white kids who were accused of attacking this young black girl. They are certainly the victims. Other victims are other young black girls or young white girls or young white boys or any kid who is actually attacked in some bigoted way. They're the victims too. The big difference here is not how you view race, it's not how you view sex, it's not how you even view crime. The big difference, why does the left fall for it? Because the left has an unrealistic view of society and of the culture. The left always leaps on these because they think the culture really hates women, or the culture really hates black people, or the culture really hates Hispanics, or any other racial minority group, or homosexuals, or people who are confused about their sex, or any, anyone else. It doesn't. Most Americans are basically good people. Half of the country is not irre irredeemable and deplorable, like Hillary Clinton said it was. 
conservatives are better at sussing these out because we just know yeah, that doesn't really happen, especially at a school if, that's going to have secret service protection at it and has pretty heightened security. I just, it doesn't pass the smell test. These hoaxes happen. Now, one conclusion of this for me, I, whenever I read politics, I learn this more and more. It's good to cultivate humility. The more I read, the more I realize I don't know anything. The more I learn, the more I realize I don't know anything. The more books I crack open, the more I realize I don't know very much. But our society doesn't cultivate that virtue of humility, which is the most important of the virtues in many ways. If, if pride is the queen of all sins, then the opposite of pride is humility. And that's an important beginning for understanding and for wisdom. I feel this way not just about politics or crime or anything. I feel this with scientific studies. It's not that I'm a science denier, to use the term that the left uses. Far, far from it. It's actually the opposite. Uh, because I do believe in the scientific method, I believe in skepticism, and I believe in rigor, and I, I believe that studies need to be replicated, and I believe that the inherited wisdom of thousands and thousands of years has been tested over time. It's not that it's old wisdom. It's that it's the newest wisdom because it's survived so much rigor over the years, and if there's some new faddish sort of study that comes out of some university somewhere, I'm just a little skeptical of it. They do this all the time. You see this with nutrition. So with nutrition, they tell you, one day, coffee is great for you. Drink 20 cups of coffee a day. It's, it's really good for you. Then about, I don't know, five hours later, they tell you, coffee is going to kill you. If you have two sips of coffee, you're going to die. And they don't just do it with coffee. They do it with eggs. Every other day of the week, eggs are good for you. And then the other day, they're bad for you. They do the same thing with smoking. So we learn that smoking is probably not great for you if you're inhaling all of these things into your lungs. Then we were told there's something called secondhand smoke, which is going to kill you if you ever walk by somebody on the street. Now, there's no evidence for this whatsoever. There's not a lot of rigor around secondhand smoke. Doesn't matter. Then we heard there's something called thirdhand smoke, which is if you smoke in an apartment, let's say, and then you move out of the apartment, and then someone else moves into the apartment and they can smell it a little bit on the carpet or something. That's third-hand smoke. That's going to kill you too. Pretty soon there's going to be fourth, fifth, and sixth-hand smoke. Not based in science at all. They change their mind on these things every single day. Now we get to one of my favorite ones. This just came out. For years and years and years now, I have been told, in part by sweet little Elisa, who cares for my health. She knows I don't treat my body very well and she wants me to live a long time. She tells me, Man! Say, yes, sweet little Elisa. She goes, Mike, eat less red meat. Say, no, no, I don't think I'm going to do that. Now, her argument is red meat is bad for you. How do we know red meat is bad for you? A bunch of guys in white coats told us that for a few years. So you got to eat less red meat. And I thought, no, first of all, if I'm going to eat less red meat, life might not be worth living, so I'm going to do it. Also now, for some reason, it's irritating the environmentalists. The environmentalists are saying that if you eat red meat, you're destroying the environment, and they get really anxious and worked up about this, and I consider that funny, so I guess I need to eat more hamburgers, and also because it tastes good, and I like it. I've been pushing back on this. But the study, the scientific studies, they're so clear. They're so, no, they're not. There's a new scientific study out, totally called it, new scientific study out, that says there is no reason to eat less red meat. What they find is that the evidence that was used to justify telling individuals to eat less beef and also to eat less pork is weak. There's just no, uh, there's no real way to justify that recommendation. And what they say is these findings, when you find things like this, it erodes public trust in the scientists. Uh, it doesn't erode my trust in science. I know science is very difficult, and I know that the world is very complicated, and I know that ideologues who want to tell us that they have discovered something, this, this secret, the key to life, if you do this one thing, your life will be perfect, and you just, that isn't true. And if scientists can't figure out red meat, if scientists can't figure out the food pyramid generally, you remember when the food pyramid said you got to eat a lot of carbohydrates and then some fruits and vegetables and then a little bit of dairy and then barely any fat. And then one day, about a year or two ago, the scientists came out really quietly. It was like a Friday afternoon. And they said, hey, hey, uh, by the way, you know that food pyramid? Uh, it, it's the opposite. All right, well, we're heading out of work now. So sorry, no questions. No, we can't. Yeah, but what was no, I, Yeah, it, it's the opposite now. So just do the opposite of the food pyramid. Nobody even seemed to bat an eye. They say, okay, well, the scientists say it's the opposite now, so I guess we'll follow that. I don't believe them on this one either. When I see my friends losing a lot of weight on the keto diet, 
I get a little nervous for them. I have a lot of friends who have lost weight on the keto diet. And they say, oh yeah, keto, this is like the new way to go. This is going to give you a long life. I think, I, you're definitely losing weight and you look better. But I don't know if a diet that causes you to lose lots of weight very quickly is necessarily the healthiest diet. It seems to me, like for most of human history, diets that allowed you to sort of preserve your body fat were considered better diets. Anyway, I'm just saying what all of these things bring up is that we need to have a little skepticism. We need to be a little more aware of our faculties of reason. We need to maybe question some of our premises if our premises keep being proven wrong, that the scientists know everything. They get everything wrong on coffee, they get it wrong on eggs, they get it wrong on red meat, they get it wrong on everything, and we think that they're going to be able to predict with perfect certainty the weather in 100 years. Hmm. I mean, kids are taking off school for this. You've got people losing their minds. There's climate anxiety. People are going to therapists because of climate anxiety. The scientists can't predict the weather in 100 years. They can't even predict the food pyramid next week. Red meat is good. I'm going to enjoy some red meat tonight. Speaking of the reds, we've got to get to the 70th anniversary of red China. Unfortunately, I have to take a little issue with President Kofefe. He does a great job generally, but he's getting this anniversary of the communist government in China completely wrong. Then bad news for Joe Biden again. Some more hoaxes on the wage gap and so much more. But first, I've got to say goodbye to Facebook and YouTube. You know, I also want to mention before we head out, just in the interest of using skepticism and your faculties of reason, I want to correct something that we said yesterday. Yesterday we were covering the story of Lupron, which is the uh, puberty blocking drug that is used on transgender children, quote unquote, that is used on children whose parents insist they have gender dysphoria and gender confusion. And there was a report out that that killed 6,300 people, that drug, and it's now currently being used on children. That is true, though I, I think I may have said on the show yesterday that it killed 6,300 children, and that is not accurate. They killed 6,300 people, and the drug is being used on children, but in terms of actual specific on that number. I just don't have it. So in the interest of using our skepticism and faculties of reason, I want to bring that up. By the way, Another Kingdom season three is just days away. This is the final season of Another Kingdom. It is so wonderful. I don't even like novels, and I certainly don't like fantasy. I love Another Kingdom, and I, I feel that I can say this without any sort of false modesty or, or fears about being prideful, because I narrate Another Kingdom, the audiobook and the podcast, but Drew does all the work. Drew Clavin writes the whole thing, and it is excellent. And, and the first season was so good. It was a big hit when it came out. Season two also was very, very successful. This season is the best one yet. I know that doesn't happen usually, but it is so, so good. It is profound. I was reading the audiobook of se season one just a couple months ago, and I by the end of it, I was crying in the booth. I mean, it's just really excellent. So subscri subscribe today. Episodes one and two of season three drop Monday, October 7th, but subscribers get exclusive access to them this Friday, October 4th. Also, seasons one and two, if you haven't listened to them, are available on dailywire.com, iTunes, and YouTube, so make sure to check those out before embarking on this new journey, which is great. You know what you get at dailywire.com. Ten bucks a month, hundred dollars for an annual membership. You get me, you get the Andrew Clavin Show, you get the Ben Shapiro Show, you get the Matt Walsh Show, you get to ask questions in the mailbag that's coming up, so get them in. You get another kingdom early. You get all this great stuff. You get the Leftist Tears Tumblr. You're going to need it. As more and more of their premises and presuppositions turn out to be hoaxes, you will drown if you don't have the Tumblr. Go get it. Dailywire.com will be right back with a lot more. All right, it's the 70th anniversary of communist China. President Trump tweeted about this. He said, quote, congratulations to President Xi and the Chinese people on the 70th anniversary of the People's Republic of China. I give Trump slack on a lot of things because he's doing such a great job and he's very good at cutting deals and I pretty much want to give him some grace on the tweets because he's doing so good generally that far be it from me to throw stones when I don't need to. This was a bad tweet. There was no reason to send this tweet. I don't under, if there was a reason, I certainly don't understand it. The communist takeover of China is one of the greatest tragedies of the 20th century. 
possibly one of the greatest tragedies in history. It should never have happened. We could have stopped it, and we didn't. After the Chinese Civil War, the, but that was between the communists and the nationalists. The communists drove the Chinese nationalist government under Chiang Kai-shek from mainland China to Taiwan. This is why the Taiwan is such a politically volatile issue even today. That happened in 1949. The Korean War begins in June 1950, right after that. And the whole idea of the Korean War was to sa save South Korea from falling into the invading communist forces hands from the north. So that, that begins in June 1950. By December 1950, it's no longer just the Korean War. You have hundreds of thousands of Chinese troops invading North Korea and fighting face to face with American troops. This drives the U.S. forces back to South Korea. This is a war that we were engaged in with China, at least briefly. General MacArthur wanted to take the war to China because obviously China was fighting a war with us. He wanted to bomb China and he wanted to fight alongside the nationalist Chinese government forces which were in Taiwan against the communists and freaking President Truman refused. He said no. MacArthur said yes, we got to take care of it now, we're going to have to take care of it later. Truman said no. The conflict boiled over into public view and in April 1951, very famously, President Truman fired General MacArthur. And this was considered a great triumph of civilian government over the military. No way. Had we not gone weak in Korea, had we pushed to actually win the war rather than just leave it as this stalemate, which seems to be a, a solution to war now favored by many people on the left in the United States, if we had actually pushed and won, the history of the 20th century and almost certainly the 21st century would look radically different. Cold War would look radically different. Maybe we wouldn't have gotten bogged down in Vietnam. Maybe we we would have won the Vietnam War, maybe we wouldn't have even had to fight it in the first place. And maybe 58,000 Americans and their kids and grandkids wouldn't have perished over there in Vietnam. Also, an estimated 35 to 45 million people died as a result of the communist revolution in China. And those are even fairly conservative numbers. All those people would have lived and their kids and their grandkids. The communist takeover of China was one of the great tragedies of history. What is President Trump doing congratulating them on 70 years of communist oppression? Maybe, I want to keep an open mind, maybe he's trying to signal something to Kim Jong-un because Kim Jong-un in North Korea has been a key aspect of his foreign policy such as it is. Maybe President Trump is signaling an ideological shift to Kim Jong-un in North Korea that we're willing to overlook certain abuses and we're even over to look ideological wickedness like communism if you come to the table and negotiate like Trump is negotiating with with China. Maybe this would be a very blunt way to signal that. You got the President of the United States congratulating the dictator of China on the the communist revolution. That, this would be a very blunt way to do that. President Trump is a blunt instrument. In any case, we should just correct the record on this and we should have skepticism and to use our faculties of reason even on our own side. The legacy of communist China is a legacy of brutality and misery and evil. It should never be celebrated and it should always be regretted. And speaking of regrets and communists, no that's going too far, but speaking of regrets, I bet that Joe Biden has a few regrets right now because you remember, we've been talking about this, giving you an update every day as new information leaks out. Fox News' Peter Ducey asked Joe Biden about a week or two ago whether Joe Biden had ever, ever spoken to his son about his foreign business dealings. And in no uncertain terms, Joe Biden denied ever speaking to his son about those foreign business affairs. I've never spoken to my son about his overseas business dealings. Okay. When that aired, when Peter Ducey was asking him that question, coincidentally, I was actually on Fox. And so they cut back to me right away and said, what's your reaction? I said, there's no way that that's true. I don't know anything more than listening to his response. There's no way that that's true. Later, we found out Hunter Biden undercut the story when he spoke to the New Yorker magazine, and he admitted that he had talked on at least one occasion to Joe Biden about the business dealings in Ukraine, and Joe Biden said, you better know what you're doing, because obviously it sounded pretty crooked. Last night, Tucker Carlson, also on Fox News, found a photograph, exclusively found a photograph of Joe Biden playing golf with Hunter Biden and Hunter Biden's business partner in the Ukrainian energy company, Burisma Holdings. Here it is. 
Is Biden's claim true? Well, a photograph obtained exclusively by this show, not to brag, but we did, suggest that claim might not be true. The picture shows, it's on the screen, Biden on a 2014 golfing trip with his son, as well as his son Hunter's business partner, Devin Archer. At the time, this picture was taken, both of them on the board of the Ukrainian energy company, Burisma. There it is. There it is. So you're telling me they go out and play 18 holes, smoking cigars, walking around the course. Not once does their work come up. Not once does the thing that unites all three of them ever come up. Very difficult for me to imagine that. Also, Joe Biden, stop admitting to this stuff on film. You know, Joe Biden, when he, when he first went in and allegedly got the prosecutor who was looking into his son's crooked deal, uh, when he got that prosecutor fired and then replaced him with a hand-picked successor, if Joe Biden had just kept his mouth shut about it, you could understand people get a little dodgy in politics. But he actually went to the Council on Foreign Relations and bragged about it on Camrys. What are you doing, dude? Same thing here. If you know that your son is engaging in a pretty shady business practice and trading on your name and the power of the federal government of the United States, maybe don't smile for photographs with your son and his business partner in the same energy company, which is what he did. Joe Biden, I mean, just another reminder here, by the way, it is a mistake to lie in politics. Politicians lie. We think of all politicians as lying. The good politicians don't really lie. I mean, that you know, President Trump lies about his crowd sizes occasionally. Occasionally he exaggerates his crowd sizes. He, he draws pretty big crowds anyway, but he speaks like a New Yorker. He's hyperbolic. So in that way, he's dishonest. You'll find though on most of the things that matter, he doesn't really lie. He, he has this sort of refreshing candor which actually some conservatives get upset about sometimes because they think he's saying too much, he's tweeting too much. They, they say very often they wish he would shut up. Joe Biden lies. He has no regard for the truth. And the reason it's a mistake to lie in politics is not just because it's immoral and it's wrong to do. The reason is you're going to get caught. And increasingly you're going to get caught because everything's on camera and everything is recorded these days. It does come out in the end. It looks like it's coming out. When Peter Ducey first asked Joe Biden that question and he told that obvious lie, I reacted to it and I said, this was obviously a lie. But then the second conclusion that you draw from that is, Joe Biden's not gonna be long for this race. Joe Biden had maybe the best shot going in of getting the nomination. If he continues to focus on this, that is going to be taken away from him. The correct answer for Joe Biden, if he's asked, did you ever talk to your son about his business dealings? You say, I don't know what I've talked to my son about. He's my son and I love him. I'm sure we've talked about a lot of things. You want to distract with this Trump propaganda, that's fine. But I'm talking to, about the issues that the American people care about. And then he goes back and talks about his campaign stump speech. That's the better way to do it. Then you don't get yourself in this trap where you're backed into a corner where obviously you're going to be caught in a lie. And you don't get yourself in this trap where you have to talk about a story that is only going to reflect negatively on you. So Joe Biden doubles down. I never talked to him about it. And you got to talk about Trump's dealings in the Ukraine. What Trump did is so terrible in the Ukraine. No, get the Ukraine out of the news. When, when Joe Biden made that comment, nobody knew what was going on in Ukraine. Nobody knew about Burisma Holdings. Nobody knew that he set up a crooked deal with his son to get paid $600,000 a year for doing nothing. Now they do, because he pushed the story. Big, big mistake. Huge, and they're trying to impeach Trump over this. The more that they try to impeach Trump over this hoax issue, this total nonsense that he colluded with Ukraine after he colluded with Russia, the, the worse it's going to look for Joe Biden. You got that hoax. You got the hate hoaxes. You got the meat hoaxes, the red meat hoaxes. And then there's one more hoax. This is a pernicious hoax that just has existed in the popular consciousness for years, turning away from foreign policy, now turning to economics, you know about the wage gap hoax. You know how this goes. This is the myth that men and women are paid different amounts of money for the same work, which is obviously ridiculous because if that were the case, then business owners would only hire women. Unless you really think that the great capitalists of America care more about defending the patriarchy than they do about making money, then obviously this thing falls apart. And it's been repeatedly debunked, but it keeps coming back. 
Why does it keep coming back? Because it's true. There is a wage gap between the average woman and the average man. And then they go on and say specifically the average Latino woman or the average black woman or the average, and then they go down the identity politics chart. There is a wage gap. It, it does exist, but not for the same work, not for the same educational qualifications, not for the same hours worked, not for the same time in the workforce, not for the same negotiated rates, not for any of that. When you consider all of those factors, the wage gap virtually disappears. And actually, in some places, it, it exists, except the women are paid more than the men. And so now the media are, in a sort of small way, admitting that this is a hoax, and they're still presenting it as a problem for women, which I just love. This is headline actually from the New York Post. Women are struggling to find men who make as much money as they do. Now, the headline could be, women are making a ton of money. Or the headline could be, women are making more money than men. That'd be, a, that'd be a good headline, I guess. But instead, because it's one of these identity politics stories, and I'm not blaming the Post, everybody's doing this, and it's the way it's been framed. Because of identity politics, because women always have to be the victims, and they can't ever have anything nice happen in, in this leftist view of America as being hopelessly sexist and bigoted, even when women make more money than men, the story becomes women are struggling to find men who make as much money as they do. Fair enough. Based on a new study published in the Journal of Marriage and Family, which is based on research from Cornell, shows that women are having trouble finding rich guys. The lead author of the study, Daniel Lichter, says, quote, there are shortages of economically attractive men. And he says, Marriage is fundamentally an economic transaction. I, I, I don't know if he's going to have to answer to his wife for that one. And women want partners who are at least their economic equals, and maybe they want men who make more money than they do. Okay, fine. My only point on this is you've got to pick a lane. So you can either keep pushing the wage gap hoax, or you can keep pushing that women have it really rough because they can't find men who make more money than they do. Either one. You can make either of those, but you can't have them both at the same time. This is uh, not going away because of the, the premises that people are beginning with. If the premise that you're starting with is society's bad for women, then if women don't make enough money, it's bad for women. If women make too much money, it's bad for women. Same thing on race, same thing on sexual identity, same thing on any of these issues. Maybe this means we need to re-examine our premises. Maybe this means we're looking at things just a little bit wrong. And by we, I of course mean the left. Brings us to impeachment, which is the big issue here, right? Some people really like getting into the nitty gritty issues of this impeachment stuff. Some people really want to figure out, they're waiting for Adam Schiff's new document to come out. They're waiting for it, just like they're waiting for the scientific study to figure out if red meat is good or bad for you today. I don't care. I don't care about what Adam Schiff puts out. I don't care what the inspector general puts out, frankly. I don't care about this Ukraine thing or the impeachment inquiry. They blew it. The Democrats blew it. I could have cared if it was their first shot at this or their second shot or their third shot. But it isn't. They've been doing this since day one. Okay. And as a result of that, faculties of skepticism, faculties of reason. We've heard this song before. I'm not going to get worried about it. You know, it, the left, if you're a leftist and you're getting really excited for impre impeachment, calm down. If you're a conservative and you're getting really worried about impeachment, calm down. We have heard this song before. Newsbusters compiled a supercut of the mainstream media talking about impeachment since a few days after President Trump was elected. Here it is. If he takes the risk of going to trial and he's convicted, that could be seen as an impeachable offense. So this is from 2016. Camera, snorting cocaine in the yep, White House. Now Maybe we're with here one of his children. in 2016. There was at least a chance he'd be impeached. If he's not... Okay, now we're in January 2017. There are tools that Congress has. I don't see how that wouldn't be an 
impeachable offense. Still that in 2017. The now we're in March 2017. Impeachable offense more fully than what Bill Clinton Lawrence was O'Donnell. impeached for. Impeachment is very difficult. Chris Matthews 2017. Chris Cuomo 2017. More 2017. Is impeachment the appropriate remedy? Something through the Congress like impeachment. All of that may be impeachable. That's this is two years offense. ago, keep in mind. Is that an impeachable offense? Is that an impeachable offense? Okay, now we're in 2018. Same story. Impeachment. A potential <laughs> Same story, different day. Where do you see an impeachable offense? It is grounds for impeachment. This is still a year ago, by the or way. Even impeachable grounds for impeachment, or does that not go far enough in your view? Grounds for impeachment. This tweet alone may be an impeachable offense. Let's talk about impeachment. Impeachment is on the table. Which impeachable offense is an impeachable offense? Do you see okay, now we're in 2019. It's an impeachable offense. If that's we're in March 2019. I don't know what is? The president <laughs> shall be removed from office on impeachment. Is it impeachable? 100 percent is impeachable. This is the one. They're going to get him this time. Oh, yes. They're going to, I can't believe it. If you are a left winger and you're getting so excited about this, you probably, you probably put your It's Muller Time t-shirt back on. You had that one in the closet. You had to dust that one off. Maybe you, hey, you got your Stormy Daniels t-shirt. Remember that? Remember Stormy Daniels? Remember Michael Avenatti? We're going to forget about Michael Avenatti for the 335 years he's facing in prison, but he was a big news story when he was around. If you believe, that, calm down, skepticism, humility, it'll really help you out. And this brings me to actually one of my favorite stories. We'll, we'll close here. There's a, a, a new U.S. version of The Spectator, which I always enjoy reading. And they published a column today by Megan Murphy. Megan Murphy is a feminist. She is the editor of Feminist Current. And she was famously kicked off of Twitter for saying, women aren't men which is another version of what I said men aren't women when I got attacked by some Antifa weirdo in Missouri. This is apparently a very controversial statement these days. Megan Murphy and I don't have a lot in common. We see the world very differently. She's a leftist and she's a feminist. But on a few issues, she gets it very right. And there's a great column that I uh, suggest you read today. It's called, No, I Will Not Listen to the Children. Subline, we live in a world that tells young people anything they feel or believe must be validated. And this is a big issue because it incentivizes very bad and very exploitative politics, especially on the left. But it also has us turn our faculties of reason off. She points out, she writes, quote, I can't help but see progressives fetishization of youth and youth activism as self-serving. It not only elicits an emotional reaction from people rather than a rational one, but it is used by adults as a means to virtue signal. Children are viewed as inherently moral and good, and therefore those who listen to children and support our youth are also positioned as inherently moral and good. Listen to the children is a terrible mantra that only exists in order to pressure people into nodding along unthinkingly to generally oversimplistic ideas. Couldn't have said it better myself. Do not allow yourself to be a victim of that overly simplistic and unthinking culture. Think for yourself and you will b help build and rebuild a culture that actually values evidence, reason, humility, and all that is good, true, and beautiful, which we see eroding daily. But so much of that could come back if we just got a little more street smart, just wised up to how people are taking advantage of us. That's our show. Got a lot more to get to. We'll do it tomorrow. In the meantime, I'm Michael Knowles. This is The Michael Knowles Show. See you then. The Michael Knowles Show is produced by Rebecca Dobkowitz and directed by Mike Joyner. Executive producer, Jeremy Boring. Senior producer, Jonathan Hay. Our supervising producer is Mathis Glover. And our technical producer is Austin Stevens. Assistant director, Pavel Wydowski. Edited by Danny D'Amico. Audio is mixed by Mike Coromina. Hair and makeup is by Jesua Olvera, and our production assistant is Nick Sheehan. The Michael Knowles Show is a Daily Wire production. Copyright Daily Wire 2019. On The Matt Wall Show, we're not just discussing politics. We're talking culture, faith, family, all of the things that are really important to you. So come join the conversation.